Hi Stephanie, James Weir from Steward Wealth. I'm here today with Professor Stephanie Kelton, a Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Stony Brook University in New York. Stephanie is a, a leading expert on modern monetary theory, which is more popularly known perhaps by its acronym of MMT. Um, former Chief Economist of the US Senate Budget Committee uh, and was named by Politico as one of the 50 people most influencing policy in America. And Professor Kelton advises policymakers and consults with investment banks and portfolio managers across the globe. After the release of her New York Times best-selling book, The Deficit Myth, she's become a regular commentator and national, on national radio and television, and is in Australia helping to promote a movie called Finding the Money. So, Professor, author, and now movie star, uh, Professor Stephanie Kelton. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, James. It's great to be with you. MMT proponents say it's, a, it's simply a framework based on the rock solid laws of accounting that explains how money actually works in a modern economy. And to that extent, it's politically agnostic. But from its inception, it, it has been targeted by the right as progressive nonsense. Uh, how did MMT become so political? Mm, that's a good question because when I first was drawn to these ideas, I was, um, you know, I had an undergraduate degree in finance. I had studied a little bit of accounting, but I was a graduate student at Cambridge University and I was studying economics. And so when I first encountered the ideas, they came from a guy named Warren Mosler, who was a fixed income trader. He's an investor. He's like a Wall Street guy. And Warren was a really careful thinker though, and he had written his ideas down and published them in the form of like a little booklet. He called it soft currency economics. And this was Warren's way of trying to explain, right, provide a description of the monetary system that we have, the mechanics of government finance, how the debits and credits work when governments spend and collect taxes and sell bonds. And I liked the framework and it appealed to me because of the study in finance and accounting. And I, I just liked knowing how things work. And so there was nothing political at all about it when I first encountered it. But you're right that over the years, um, as the ideas began to seep out and people started hearing you know, we're not thinking about public policy the right way. We're thinking of government finances like household finances, and they don't really work like that. And that started to open up space for a different conversation about the kinds of options that should be on the table for a government, either a conservative government or a liberal government or anybody in between. And we put those uh, ideas out there and we provided the description and I would say actually the first people who got interested in our work were from finance. It was journalists who covered financial markets who started writing about it. And then later with all of the attention around climate and people started talking about things like a Green New Deal, we had some politicians, you know, prominent, um, exciting, young people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a young congresswoman. And really I think when she invoked MMT, as uh, something that she had thought about as a way of say, answering questions like, well, how could you afford to spend so much money tackling a problem as big as climate change? And she responded in part by saying something about MMT and it just blew up. Uh, it was headlines in virtually you know, every newspaper the following day. And I think that then started to, in people's minds, become you know, something you associate MMT with the Green New Deal or with uh, more progressive candidates. But it took a long while before that started to happen. And, and for a lot of years, it was just a sort of agnostic, as you said, description mm. of how things actually work. Mm. And that bifurcated US political system, if AOC says one thing, then the other side 
says it has to be the other. But you know, when with some people would listen to what we were saying and, and they would say things like, you know, this was in the, say, early 2000s or even the late 1990s. And people would say, well, Reagan already had all of this figured out in the 1980s. So they heard the kinds of things we were saying and said, well, Reagan must have been an mmt -er. And then when Donald Trump and the Republicans pushed their big tax cuts through in 2017, there were all kinds of headlines saying Donald Trump is basically an mmt -er at this point. So it's clear that you know people have it in their minds that any time you do something that is ambitious when it comes to you know legislation and fiscal policy, whether it's on the tax or the spending side. If you go big, there's something in people's minds about you know unshackling yourself from the discipline of you know sound finance and and balanced budgets. And mm -hmm. once you start uh, doing something big, people automatically sort of think hey, they must have been influenced by MMT. It's mm -hmm. kind of a strange thing actually, uh, because MMT doesn't advocate bigger deficits. It could be perfectly consistent with MMT to have an MMT economist advise you to try to reduce the size of your deficit or even strive for surpluses. We're agnostic about the budget outcome. It's the real economy that matters and outcomes in the real economy. Inflation, unemployment, those are the things that matter. Mm. Imagine if we had have had Donald Trump to quote MMT as the, as the basis for doing a $1.2 trillion tax cut. <laughs> well, you know, this is the funny thing. When COVID hit and Donald Trump was president and the very first fiscal package that members of Congress passed and he signed uh, into law was called the CARES Act and it was a $2.2 trillion package. And uh, he was, you know, standing at the podium, the White House press corps was there, people were asking about, you know, the size of this package and somebody, uh, a reporter said to him, this is a huge spending bill. He said the size of this thing could choke a horse. And he said, it's astronomical. Where, what do you say about all of this money? And Donald Trump said, he said, it's 6.2 trillion because it's 4 trillion, the regular budget, federal budget. And he said it's 4 trillion plus 2.2, which was the CARES Act. So he likes to you know, provide the math. It's 4 trillion plus 2.2, so it's 6.2 trillion, he said. And then he said, we can easily handle it because of who we are and what we are. He said, it's our, it's our currency, it's our money. And when he said that, I was at home watching it live and I thought, there it is. And then there went the headlines saying, you know, Donald Trump is taking on board this idea that there's something special about having a sovereign currency. Almost about being quoting the, Alan Greenspan. Absolutely, about being, you know, the issuer of the currency and having the capacity to do what no one else in the economy could do during COVID. Mm -hmm. Households losing jobs. We lost 22 million jobs in the first two months of COVID. Mm -hmm. Businesses being told you have to close, you can't open your doors, and they're thinking, how am I going to make payroll? How am I going to keep, you know, the lease and 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 the you know vendors paid and all the rest of it? Mayors and governors begging for help, saying I can't keep essential services going. Everybody's out of money, and everybody points to the federal government and says you have to help us. Well, what is it about the federal government that makes you think they're in any better position to spend money than anybody else? And the answer is they get to issue the currency and that gives them the power of the purse. They can step in in a crisis moment like that and commit trillions of dollars, exactly what they did. Yeah. So it's, you mentioned MMT there. and it's, Your best-selling book, The Deficit Myth, came out in June of 2020, just at a time when the world was wrestling with the implications of the COVID pandemic. And of course, the, the government was committed to issuing trillions, 25% of GDP in the end got injected into the economy to support households. And coinciding with your book and raising the profile of, of, of MMT, not surprisingly, it became almost seen as a test of MMT. And then lo and behold, after inflation hit 0.1% in May of 2020, two years later, inflation was 9.1%. And the critics of MMT who all yell, unleash the printing machine, you will get hyperinflation, said, I told you so. How do you respond to that? It was, was MMT to blame for the inflation? 
Okay, so a few things. First, we didn't get hyperinflation. We did get high inflation for the first time in many decades, um, but so did everybody else. And while the US, I would say, did more than just about any country in the world in terms of the fiscal response, we had a very robust fiscal response after COVID. Uh, we did get inflation. One of the first things we teach students in economics is not to confuse correlation with causation. Mm -hmm. So yes, you got uh, an ambitious and bold fiscal response, and yes, you got higher inflation. So the two things happened alongside one another, but it doesn't mean that the former caused the latter. So you look at other countries and you say, well, what about countries that did far less than the US, didn't offer nearly as much fiscal support? Some of them got even higher inflation rates than we got uh, in the US. And then you say, well, what about people who really did uh, a kind of autopsy, who attempted to look at the inflation and break it down and say, where did it come from? In the very early phase of the pandemic, the first sign of inflation, you drill down into the CPI and you say, okay, I got all these different things that, that cause inflation, different factors, where's it coming from? And it was all coming from used car prices. The whole of the story could be boiled down to used car prices. And then we could back out and I could explain why that happened. And then it started to broaden into other categories. But look, people who have done the hard work, whether it's the San Francisco Fed or Moody's Analytics, the rating agencies, or anybody else who's dug into this will say, that the fiscal packages contributed modestly to inflation. The San Francisco Fed said it might have added three tenths of one percentage point to inflation. The vast majority of the inflation came from problems related to the pandemic. Workers who left the labor force because they either didn't want to take jobs they deemed were too risky or they were staying home to care for someone else. And we had fewer workers and employers were trying to you know, find workers and that pushed wages up a little bit. You had bottlenecks. Everybody remembers the supply chains and you know, big ships at port trying to get in and shipping costs, containers and trucking and all of those things. And then a war erupts you know, with Russia and Ukraine and energy and food become an issue at some point. So I think what we had was just a series of supply shocks and they came one after another after another. And the people who I think have done the research and really tried to do a judicious job explaining where the inflation come from have landed on the side of this was a supply side story, not an excess fiscal policy story. And as the supply chains re you know, began to repair themselves and the pandemic started to abate, the inflation naturally drifted downward over time, so. And it's followed the same pattern across the entire world. It has, it sure has, yeah. So central banks slapping themselves on the back, high-fiving, we did it, we controlled inflation. Are we supposed to think that despite different rates of increase, different levels of increase, yet the pattern was the same across the world, inflation up like this and down like this, was it central bank working their magic? I know. Or was it yeah. coincidence? I, I think, look, I think it was coincidence. And again, it comes back to correlation versus causation. Yes, most central banks raised interest rates. And yes, inflation has drifted down globally. So you got these two things happening alongside one another. You could be tempted to say inflation came down because central banks lifted interest rates and did a good job fighting and reining that inflation back in. But then I would say, well, hang on. What about Japan? How do you explain <laughs> that story? Because Japan is this very interesting case where this is a country that tried for 30 years to push inflation up to their 2% target. And they couldn't hit their own 2% target for the better part of three decades. And all of a sudden the pandemic comes and now Japan has an inflation problem, inflation running above 4%. And it's sort of like, Wow, we were trying for 30 years to get inflation, and now the pandemic has finally delivered you know, the, the inflation that we were desperately trying to get. Higher than they wanted, for sure. But you know, the Bank of Japan said, this inflation is coming from the supply side. And if we raise interest rates, raising interest rates is designed to work on the demand side of the economy. It's designed to encourage businesses and households to borrow and spend less. So it doesn't make sense to us that raising rates to fight this kind of inflation is the right move. So what did they do? They left the policy rate unchanged through the entire 
entirety of the pandemic. And where it started was negative. So today, as we're sitting here, the policy rate in Japan is still negative and inflation has come crashing down. They didn't have to raise interest rates at all to get to the point of inflation drifting back down. Now they're at the point where they're saying, please drift to two and stay there. They're just hoping it doesn't drift back down to sub 2% where it was prior to COVID. Mm. And just to be clear, the 25% the of GDP, which was injected into the households, money created and gone into the back pockets, is that, is that what MMT would be advocating, this fire hose approach to, to fiscal spending? Is, is that part of the MMT framework? No, but you know, it's so hard in a panic, right? I mean, this is policy making in a panic. This isn't when you have the luxury of time and you can you know, budget judiciously and think very carefully about where you want to commit resources for infrastructure, healthcare, education, or climate related things. This was, okay, 22 million people lost their jobs in the last two months. Businesses are in danger of just going under. When you tell restaurants, bars, theaters, nail salons, coffee shops, everybody, gyms, you can't open your doors, you're gonna lose an enormous number of business. We might lose half of all the businesses in the economy. So I think Congress did the right thing. There was, they did not have the luxury of time on their side. They had to pull out, as you say, the, the money bazooka and sort of just spray cash everywhere to hold things together. And you know, one of the things we learned as a consequence of this is would have been better to be able to tailor uh, some of the programs a little bit differently, but in the end, my goodness, the, the balance sheets of the household and business sector were repaired and strengthened to the extent that the Federal Reserve could take rates from zero to five and a quarter percent without really causing much damage at all. In fact, it might be the case that the rate hikes themselves have helped in some ways to support the economic mm. recovery. Mm. So you, you've just got a lot of uh, people whose finances are in really good shape. And the U.S. is the uh, fastest growing economy in the world, outperforming our peer countries in the G7 by a wide margin, two years of unemployment staying below 4%. And this is just an incredible success story. We used to hear uh, with COVID, people said it's gonna be potentially a Great Depression 2.0. And then there was talk of a K-shaped recovery. Well, you know, half the population is gonna get left behind. Exactly the opposite happened. We had this remarkable V-shaped recovery and the wages, real wages, for the bottom half of the country have finally been rising over about the last 12 months. It's been decades mm -hmm. since the bottom half saw real gains, you know, real wages have been stagnant for the majority of the country for a long time. Now here we are, the people at the, in the bottom half are actually seeing relative uh, improvement over time. So it's amazing. And it's one of the, I guess one of the principles of MMT is the power of fiscal policy, whereas the focus on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in particularly media is on interest rates and monetary policy, on top of the, the COVID contribution. Of course, in the United States, you've had three very significant fiscal acts that were passed by the Biden administration, CHIPS Act, Infrastructure Act, and the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, have they contributed to this, you know, this impressive growth that the United States is posting versus the rest of the G7? And this yeah, I think, I think absolutely. You know, the, the one that you mentioned last is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a climate bill. And this is the, the largest climate um, package that's ever been passed in the United States. And the estimate was that the government would end up committing something like $370 billion. Uh, that's what the, the spend would be related to that. But because of the way the legislation was written, the commitment on the part of government was uncapped, meaning it's kind of like a candy jar with no lid. And the government is saying to people, to businesses, to homeowners, look, if you want to make investments in solar, in wind, if you want to do, you know, you're a company and you want to do big developments, offshore wind or solar, if you're a homeowner and you want to put heat pumps or solar panels or buy an electric vehicle or any of that, we'll help you with that. You want to invest in R&D for green tech and all this sort of stuff, there's money for you. So 
people saw this, especially businesses and globally, investors around the world. I was in Hong Kong not too long ago and their eyes were popping out. They were saying, where are we going to put clients' money? Where can we invest right now? And they look at Germany, they said, there's no opportunity here. They look at China, they said, this doesn't look good, but boy, does the U.S. look juicy because of this in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And so, you know, Goldman Sachs has said, the U.S. is, this is not 370 billion. This could turn out to be closer to 3 trillion over the next decade because of the uncapped nature. And it's already catalyzing so much uh, investment. So we've already blown way, way, way past 370 billion. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned that the, the higher interest rates of themselves could be, could be uh, stimulatory. Um, I understand it's close to a trillion dollars worth of interest that the federal government is now injecting into the economy in the form of newly created money. Does MMT see this as a good or a bad thing? Well, it's a little bit tricky because it's not all injected into kind of the economy, right? And that interest is paid to holders of US treasuries. And a lot of those treasuries are in pension funds, they're in insurance companies, they're in Social Security and Medicare trust funds, they're held by foreign investors, the Federal Reserve holds trillions. So it's kind of like, you know, to some extent, the interest is being paid into the pension fund or the insurance company. And I don't have a problem with that. It's being paid into Social Security or, or the Medicare trust fund. Now, it is true that in order to hold U.S. Treasuries and as an individual investor, you got to be pretty well off, right? You have to have some savings that you, you can say, okay, in my portfolio, I want to commit a certain portion of that space to this, you know, safe, risk-free, interest-bearing um, security called the U.S. Treasury. And yeah, when the federal government uh, is paying out more interest to holders of those securities over time. That's income that can be spent like any other income. Uh, it goes disproportionately to people who already have money, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they got the treasuries in the first place. And so there is uh, definitely an impact when it comes to you know, inequality. You're sending, as you said, uh, really hundreds of billions of dollars additional interest income because of the rate hikes the Fed is forcing the Treasury to pay out hundreds of billions of dollars extra each year to holders of U.S. Treasury. So do we care about that? Yeah, I think we do care about that, um, both for equity reasons, but also, you know, is there a better way to use that fiscal space if people are receiving that income and then spending a portion of it into the economy? Is that the best use of that fiscal space? Would you maybe find a better way to spend a hundred or two hundred billion dollars? Maybe healthcare or education or something yeah. climate related. And by no means would you expect to have the same effect as nine hundred billion dollars going into the back pockets of the households as it did during COVID, yeah. if it's disappearing into pension funds and high net worth back pockets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's imagine a world where. Politicians wake up tomorrow and embrace the sensibilities of, of, of MMT. Ha, ha, what mechanisms would be in place or could be put in place to stop you know, one side of politics sending welfare payments sky high or the other side of politics tripling the military budget overnight? I mean, MMT is a lens. It's a framework for analysis. And so if you think of lenses, right, like I wear contact lenses, and people who have glasses know that you go into your eye doc and you say, my vision is not good, can you help me? And the optometrist puts you through a series of, you know, which one's better and fits you with proper lenses and off you go. They don't tell you where to go or what to do after you leave the office. You're on your own at that point. And MMT is a framework for analysis. So we can help provide lawmakers with better sort of guidelines about how to operate the budget, how to think before you commit new spending. Why don't you take inflation risk into account? before you commit to spending or cutting taxes or doing something else, center inflation risk. That's what we want to see. So at that point, you know, it's a democracy and we elect people to represent us and they might pursue policies that we don't like once they vote for them and authorize them and begin spending. And then we have the right to vote them out of office and hold them accountable. 
but MMT doesn't fix our politics, right? It can't, mm -hmm. it can't do that. It can, it can help provide transparency so that people know what the, what the options are, and it can help protect us from politicians who say, we have to cut programs because there's no alternative but to deal with the deficit or the debt. We can empower the population to say, hang on, no, you're not running out of money. You're not gonna go bankrupt. We can preserve programs like Medicare and Social Security in the US, but we have to think about the inflationary impacts. How are we going to resource these programs over time? And at the end of the day, we have to hold politicians accountable for the decisions that they make. But, you know, f some group of members of Congress or parliament get together and decide they want to fund war or, um, uh, you know, defund some other program. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that that's they have me. that power and MMT can't stop that, right? It, it is a democracy and an economic um, paradigm mm -hmm. can't, can't course correct democratic outcomes. We've just passed International Women's Day and the, the dismal science of economics is, uh, is currently blessed with some brilliantly talented women, uh, all of whom are wonderfully original thinkers. You, yourself with MMT, Mariana Mazzucato, Isabella Weber, um, Kate Rayworth and, and Claudia Sam to, to name a handful, the, the Spice Girls of economics. Given such wonderful role, role models, are, are you finding that more young women are expressing an interest in economics? I think so. Um, it's slow, but I think it's changed quite a bit. You know, when I first got into economics, I can remember being at a conference and I was one of the presenters and there was a dinner at the end of the uh, day and I'm seated there and somebody takes a photo and I see the photo some years later and somebody looks at it and says, are you always the only woman? And I took the photo and I looked and it hadn't occurred to me, this is 30 years ago, you know, but it didn't really occur to me in the moment how few women there were in the field. And ever since that comment, I've really paid attention and I've been attuned to, you know, how many women are we admitting into the graduate program? How many females are in the classroom when I walk in on the first day of a semester to teach a course? And there's been a big change. There are definitely more women seeking degrees in economics and that's uh, really encouraging. And I think that some of the names that you just mentioned, these are all friends of mine, by the way. I know all of these people really well and I uh, admire them so much and I think because of their visibility and you know, women, young people, seeing the success that they've had, it's just inspired them. Well, there's a, there's a saying in economics that, uh, that, that economics changes one dead economist at a time, which sounds like a painfully slow evolutionary process. How confident or optimistic are you that MMT is going to shift the policy goalposts and, and if so, in what time frame? I think it already has. Um, you know, I, I will tell you a story that I wouldn't have told um, had he not already made this public. I wouldn't have repeated the story. But the chairman of the House Budget Committee, this is the guy who wrote really the legislation for the Democrats' $1.9 trillion um, COVID Rescue Plan Act. It was the first piece of legislation that was passed after President Biden was elected. And his name is John Yarmouth. And he um, is a Democrat. He was chair of the committee in the House, the Budget Committee. Uh, considered himself a deficit hawk his entire career. He thought the government should operate its budget like household. He thought deficits were pretty dangerous stuff. He was worried about the national debt. And then he read my book. And he reached out to me and he said, you have completely changed the way that I think. And I want to start a conversation. And this was pre-COVID. So we started talking with one another. And then COVID came and here comes the moment, right? Where he has to make a decision to get behind this enormous fiscal package, you know, an additional 1.9 trillion on top of what had already been done. And the House writes the bill and the Senate passes it. It comes back to the House, minor changes. It goes off to President Biden for his signature. And this Congressman writes to me, text message, and he said, I do not think I would have had the confidence to sh us usher that bill through had it not been for, you know, reading your book and changing the way I think. So, and he's not, he's not alone. I, I have talked with hundreds of members of Congress um, since then. And 
there has been a real shift in thinking. It's hard to fully escape some of the old ideas, uh, but I think an incredible amount of progress has already been made. I hope we can just build on it. Mm. I, mean, I guess we've been hearing since the days of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, that the debt is unsustainable and the, the paper will have to be paid at some point, but that point just never seems to come. The sky is always falling. It just never, it's chicken little. The sky is always falling and it, it never quite seems to fall. Uh, and you know, it's, it's convenient and it's, it, they weaponize it. Both sides do it, by the way. This isn't something that only uh, Republicans or conservatives do. Democrats do this too. When they don't like something that the other party wants to try to do, they say, oh, look at this it's fiscally irresponsible. You're gonna blow up the debt, you're gonna do this. So there's something comfortable about having that narrative hanging around that you can reach for. But I think, you know, deep inside, they've moved beyond this. Um, it's just that it's sometimes still considered politically expedient to be able to complain about the debt and the deficit, but I don't think very many people really believe the way they once did, that it's some sort of a, a real threat to our well-being. So MMT is slowly shifting the goalposts. Congratulations on your, the role that you play in that. Um, please keep up the good fight. Professor Stephanie Carlton, Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.